So this week's Torah portion is Ki Tietzi. I think I pronounced that correctly. But it's when you go out. So we're getting ready to enter the promised land. We're not quite there yet. We're kind of hanging out on the border and we're getting some final instructions before we cross over into the promised land. Now, last week we looked at a lot of laws and how we set up the system of jurisprudence, you know, the, the judicial system. And we're going to kind of keep going. Now we're not talking about setting up the structure so much, but these are some of the laws that are going to be given in this Torah portion. Now, what's really interesting is that out of all, hundred, out, out of all 613 mitzvot, there are 74 just in this Parsha alone. So this Parsha, and I really encourage you, if you have not read it already, go back and read it, because we're just going to be hitting the highlights here. Um, there are some things that we're just we're not going to have time to get into. This Torah portion is jam-packed with laws and, and different regulations and, and a whole, whole bunch of stuff. So I'm going to do my best to kind of give you a good overview, but it's just going to be that it's an overview. So I do encourage you to go back and really take an in-depth look at it. Because um, there's, a, there's a lot in there. So. Um, so where are we at? The scriptural theme of this Torah portion is showing honor to others through observing God's laws. Now you're going to see this theme. The Lord's going to give a law. And then we're going we're gonna to look at it and see how that honors people. Right, because that's the overarching theme. It's not just, hey, here's a whole bunch of more rules that you have to follow, and don't break any of them, you're going to be in trouble. It's these rules are established with this specific purpose of honoring your fellow man. So we're going to take a look at that. So God is concerned for the welfare of others, even in extreme circumstances. This gets really interesting, um, such as personal violation, war. I mean. These are very extreme circumstances, and yet God has laws in place that would still honor our neighbor, honor the community, honor the people. So it shows that his motivation is only our best. No matter what the mitigating circumstances is, God always has our best in mind. Now we have the choice, do we partner with that or do we re rebel against that? So. Given the immediate conquest of the surrounding nations, that's what they, uh, the people were getting ready to step into. Moses relays these specific laws from the Lord um, regarding civil life in Israel. So a lot of these are going to be what you call civil laws, right? So let's jump right in. Deuteronomy chapter 21, where there's just a, a whole list of, of laws. One of the interesting ones it talks about is during war. And it says, when you see, it's called, called the beautiful captive, right? So the men go to war, they conquer the people, and then they see a woman and say, wow, she's really attractive. And the women, we, as we know, were spared. Usually they were spared, um, but all the males were usually executed. This was because you didn't want the seed to come into an influence, right? But the females, because they're seed carriers, they can carry the seed of the people moving forward. So they were usually captive. Now, um, I know a lot of times people look at Deuteronomy and they, they kind of put them on edge when we talk about some of these things. You really talk about capturing women and all this kinds of stuff and this is, you know, sounds pretty, pretty terrible. But this was a reality. And yet God has laws that would even protect these people, even in a time of conflict and war. So, one of the law was that if a man saw this woman, he wanted to take her for himself. He couldn't just take her and that was the end of it. There was a sequence that had to happen. There was laws and governance around that. So first, she had to shave her head and cut her nails. And then her prison clothes, her clothing had to be a change, changed, right? So whether it was, some people debate whether it was prison clothes or the clothes that she was wearing when she was seen, what have you. Either way, she had to change her attire. Her, now, what are we talking about? We're not talking about shaming the woman, right? She's already a captive. There's no point in shaming somebody, right? That that's just becomes abusive. What the idea was, it's a control against lust. 
Because what does it say? When you see the beautiful woman, right? So we know that there is visible physical attraction. That's what started this whole process. So the law was shave her head, cut her nails, change her clothes. Remove the, the outward things that would draw you to her. Then wait. Then you have to wait. You have to allow her 30 days per morning. Because more than likely, either she's mourning the fact that she's a captive, or she's mourning the fact that her sons, sons slash husband were just killed in this conflict. Right? So you give them time to grieve. Okay? But now, you remove all this, uh, the point of attraction is removed, and then you wait. And then after that period, then the lady is taken to the, the bed din, right, the law court. She's taken to the law court, and she's presented, this, we get a lot of this from the oral, um, from the Talmud and some of the oral traditions. Um, that's not going to be in the text specifically. But she's given the option to willingly follow the people, right? So they're going to ask her questions. Do you want to be a part of this people? Do you want to follow our God? Do you want to follow our ways? Right? So she's given a choice. If she chooses yes, if she agrees, then she's married to the man that her, her uh, so-called captor, right? Then she was married. And upon that time, then she receives full rights and privileges of not only a citizen of the nation, but as a, as a wife. She's not a slave anymore. Now she's a part of the family. Okay? Now, what happens if she says no? Does she remain a slave? No. If she says no, if she disagrees, says, I don't want to follow your people, I don't want to serve your God, then she is to be set free. Either way, she gains freedom. She was a prisoner. She was a captive of war. And she either gains freedom as a part of the nation or freedom separate from the nation. Okay? okay. Yes? So, um, this is totally minutiae, so maybe you don't know this, but I'm thinking, what if the captor is captured her already was married and didn't want to marry her, but maybe she's, they still ask her those questions, like maybe my brother wants to marry her, or... Uh, yeah, I, I, would sure. think, I would think that if she's in the camp and she's before the judges and she says, I want to be a part, then I would, I would assume, I don't know this for a fact, but I would assume that provision would be made. And we have examples of that happening um, in other places in Scripture. So, um, But now what's interesting, though, is that... So a, a lot of times, I remember the first time I read this before I kind of had some background context, I thought, so this guy gets to capture a lady, take her back to his tent, kind of do whatever he wants, you know, and then, and then she can become part of the people or not, or, you know, he's already done what he wants to her. Well, here's the thing, that's not the case. Yes, he takes her back to his tent. He's responsible for her. He has to feed her and clothe her and make sure she's cared for for this month of waiting. Now, this is where the laws of fornication would kick in. If he were to fornicate outside of wedlock with this woman, then he's in trouble, right? Because we don't want sin in the camp. That's what Balaam did, right? He tried to use the, other, the, the women of the other nations to seduce the people, corrupt them. So just because she's in the house, it's not a free reign to do whatever. Okay? Again, protection for the captives. For people, rights for people who had no rights. So, and it kind of, it's like a built-in protection against trafficking, if you think about it that way. Right? You don't just get to snatch people up and do what you want to do with them, even in times of war. Um, now, this is interesting because it's all in the headlines with Afghanistan right now, right? The Taliban have come back. Yeah. They've taken over Afghanistan. Now, this is a big deal, if we're, especially if we're talking women's rights, right? This is a huge issue. The ta under Taliban rule, women are not allowed education past 12 years, 12 years of age. Not 12, you know, not through high school, but 12 years of age, 12 years old. No more education for you, if you're allowed at all. Um, 
no, there's public and commercial restrictions. So freedom of movement is restrained. A woman under Taliban rule cannot leave her home without a male escort anywhere. There's the, the whole burqa. You don't have to be fully clothed and fully covered. You're not allowed to own businesses. You know, if you have an entrepreneurial bone in your body, you better not be a woman in Afghanistan because it's not going to happen. And they do a lot of forced marriages. And on the surface, you know, maybe that parallels with where it's totally different, and I'll tell you why. So the idea behind the Taliban's forced marriages, it's a recruitment tool. They recruit their fighters by saying, hey, we will get you women. And so what they do is they round up all these girls. This was in July this past year. They had sent out a letter to uh, the Afghan president saying, demanding that they wanted a list of every girl, I believe it was, what was the age? I think it was 15 to 45, that range, from 15 years old to 45 years old. They wanted a list of names. Because these women were going to be taken for wives for the Taliban fighters. No choice. They definitely do not get rights once they're married. They, they just get used and abused. So um, it's, it's just a, a strategy uh, to, recruit, to recruit more fighters. And this is what the Afghan women are currently facing. You know, when we came in and we effectively removed the Taliban from rule over Afghanistan, they gained a lot of rights. They could be business owners. They could do all kinds of things. They weren't forced to marry. That's all off the table now. And, and less than 24 hours, it's gone. And now these women, a lot of these women are going to be in fear for their lives, let alone the men. I mean, the, the, you know, a lot of the men are just going to be executed. So very, very dark days there right now. But that's totally different from what we're talking about with the Israelites. Even their captives in war would receive rights, right? They would receive a measure of honor. Right? A, captive, a war captive, really, by default, no rights, no honor. You're a captive from military conflict. Your rights are stripped. They've been taken away. And yet, God sets laws in place. Wait a minute. I understand there's been a conflict. I understand that they're captives. Let's give them some rights. We don't just walk on people like that. Okay? So, we get into uh, some inheritance rights. Um, this is interesting because it talks about if a man has more than one wife, and um, basically it comes down to uh, you got two wives and you got two kids, one one from you know a son from each wife, and you like the second wife more than the first wife, and so you want to give everything to that kid because that's that's from the favored wife, and scriptures the law says no, we're not doing that. The firstborn is the firstborn, period regardless of how you feel about the spouse. That goes to the firstborn. So again, we're honoring and protecting the rights of the firstborn. It's not subject to favoritism. Okay? So that's just a, another small example. We get into um, some rebellion, talking about a rebellious child, and talking about um, someone who's hanged on a tree is cursed. Let's talk about the rebellious child first. So this is interesting. It says, if there's a rebellious child who won't listen to his parents, they bring him to the court, right, to the bed den at the city gates, and he's to be judged and say, okay, this is our son, this is our daughter, they're really rebellious, we've disciplined them, they just refuse to listen. Okay? Then, if a guilty verdict is found, the, the child would be stoned. And the reason they wanted to remove the iniquity from the people. Because what does rebellion do? Rebellion travels, right? Look at Korah. Yeah. What happened there? Started with one guy, then he got a, a, a more people to come to his cause, and then he got more people. Rebellion spreads like a plague. Yeah. And so even in our children, we can't allow the rebellion to spread. And so, pretty extreme uh, punishment. Now, if we look at uh, 1 Corinthians, let's jump over there. I want to read that really quickly. Let's see if I can find this here. 1 
First Corinthians. Um, chapter 5, verse 5. Um, now this talks about there was a different kind of sin that was being uh, dealt with in this, but it says, Hand over such a person to the adversary for his old nature to be destroyed, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Now, some verses say hand them over to Satan, right? Mm -hmm. A good way to understand this, uh, without unpacking it too much, a good way to understand this, let them continue in the way of destruction. Don't stand in there. If they are bent on going that way, let them go. Now, what does that mean? You let them go that way without fellowship. You don't watch them continue to go down the destructive path and you maintain that fellowship, right? We know if somebody calls themselves a believer and yet they're in open sin, we're not even to eat with them. We are to withdraw the hand of fellowship until they want to change. Then we can extend it again. Now, one thing that I see so often, especially with children, is you have a child that wants to go down a wayward path. And a lot of times, parents will enable that. We'll keep supporting them. Yeah, I know you're doing drugs, but you know what? You can stay with me. Right? Or, I, you know, I, I know you got an alcohol problem, but then I'll, I'll give you some money because you can't hold a job. Hey, I'm working at it, brother, okay? <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm here. There you go. There you go. So, but here's the thing. You're not to enable rebellion. That doesn't work. There's, there's a gentleman that, um, I'll just say a gentleman I know, and he tells me stories about his son. His son is uh, a drug problem. And it's to the point when they leave their house, they have security cameras on their house, they have to lock the doors, all this, not because they live in a high crime area, because they know that as soon as they leave, their son could come back. He will try to break, and has tried to break in the house to steal stuff to fund his addiction. Now, they can't have fellowship with him because of these things. I know another, another person, son had a bad drinking problem, and the parents, the parent would continually support and support and support and support. And guess what? The drinking problem never went away. Not till, yeah, it usually tends to get worse. Not until many, many years later um, did that individual take it upon themselves to correct it. But when we, when we support this, we enable this by fellowship because we care for the person. You know, they're our loved one, they're our child. It's only right that we care for them. We want to do the best and we want to do whatever we can do to help. But there's a time where it's help and then there's enablement. And if we're enabling we are partnering in their sin. It's, a, it's the same thing as saying, I'm going to help you sin, is what we're doing by our actions. Do you think that applies to spouses too, or just a parent-child relationship? I think that applies to spouses as well, yes. Codependence. Yeah, exactly, codependence. Well said. So you know, we, can, we can enable, and more often than not, when you enable somebody in their dysfunction, in their sin, they do not get better. Can they will get worse. Can you tell us why it's better for us to separate from those people? And better for them that we separate with It's, one, they're not going to be a negative influence in our, in our lives. You know, if, if somebody is going, uh, living a lifestyle contrary to the Lord, right? We know they are stepping into the realm of the curse. And so the curse is kind of, it's going to be on them. It's going to follow them. Well, if, if I open my, my home, my life, my spirit up to that, then I'm inviting that into my life space. Right. And so now I get to share their dysfunction. Right. right? Even though I'm not doing it directly. Oh, you got a drug problem and you now you're hanging out with bad people and now the bad people are on my doorstep looking for you. Now I have to deal with that. Right? So that's one reason you don't want to invite that. And two... If they're not going to listen to you, if they're not going to receive a word of counsel, a word of wisdom, hey, you're living, you're doing wrong, what are you hoping to gain by maintaining that? You know, say, I love you, but because of what you're doing, what you're involved in, I, we can't have a relationship right now. 
when you want to change that, then yes, I will, have, I will happily, I will be like the prodigal's father, and I will run down the road to meet you. Notice the prodigal's father did not go to the pig pen. He waited until he saw his son coming back. Right. Then he ran. He did not go to the pig pen. Can I give an example, kind of, with yeah, the um, some of you may or may not know my story in the past and um, some stuff with my parents, but my parents got into drugs. And um, it was both of them. So it started with one and then it moved to the other. And my mom, um, it was in the December, she went into rehab. I actually checked her in to uh, like a psych ward at the hospital. And they detoxed her. Uh, she came home and so when we were doing Christmas and all the, <laughs> you know, we grew up in church, but um, that year we actually had the best Christmas with my mom. She was normal. She was clear-headed. She was normal on her drugs. And, but being back with my dad and my dad doing drugs, it was only a matter of time. She started to do them again. She passed away January 27th of that, that next year. Because her body had been cleansed and purified, she came back into that environment was succumbed to that environment again, it actually shocked her body. And she died of an accidental drug overdose. So when it is better, it's hard to say it. it's very painful with the spouse, but it's a very fine line that you have to know what where you want to go in life. And it's, it's a very touchy subject, and it's very painful. But you see it where two will come, two become one. Yeah. To become one, and it's a it's a scriptural thing, and they go down the same path, and they could not, they couldn't both get clean. They literally, after my mom passed, my dad went to rehab and got clean, but it took him getting in a place where he was by himself to actually get clean. Yeah, yeah my, we have a relative that um, he a sibling that's her husband is an alcoholic, but she is not, and she has struggled with whether to leave or not, and she's like, well, I'll, she sort of just says, well, I'm just bearing this burden, it's my own fault. She said, that way I can only blame myself if anything happens, and I'm like, what a terrible That's way That's a sign of enabling, yeah. Yeah, That's oh like yeah, it's very, sense. she's, yeah, so uh, I just, I would love to encourage her to make that break, and he, he has tried to go to rehab several times, but he always comes back and goes right back into it, and yeah, it's hard. And that's where the you know, scripture says, if a man then choose his cap, you bless him in his cap, and you, you break ways. Yeah. yeah, there's just times where we can't, we can't maintain fellowship as much as we want to. Yeah. So. Um, so continuing on, uh, continuing on, there is this uh, passage where it talks about somebody hanged on a tree is cursed. Now we know that this is going to lead into a direct reference to Yeshua our Messiah. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is interesting. So the Talmud, it talks about this, and it gives us a little more information, is that uh, one, a man must be hanged with his face towards the people. This was interesting. You don't turn him around. So almost like he's, he's facing the people, okay? Because he's, he's being judged. He's, 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 he's been found guilty. But also, the reason they say a man who was hung on a tree is cursed because if you think about other forms of punishment, you're, you're immobilized, right? You're, you're literally nailed or tied to a tree. You're immobile. And they say that person is cursed because they would be unable at any point to fall to their knees in repentance, mm -hmm. right? They're being prevented from repenting, in essence, being on this tree. And so thus, they're cursed, implying that they were under the irre irrevocable curse of God because they can't repent. They can't fall to their hands of repentance. Pretty interesting thought there. Um, the exposed body was required to be buried before sundown to keep the land from being defiled. Right? In other cultures, especially if you if you read anything about different times in history, um, there were certain uh, certain cultures where they would go in and defeat their enemies and they would cut the heads off, put them on poles and you know, set this all up so that way people knew coming in what what was going on. But that defiles the land, right? Yeah. It makes the land unclean. Right. So if somebody was hanged, they were buried before sundown to keep the land from becoming defiled, mm -hmm. even though there was corporal or capital punishment here. 
But now, let's talk about Yeshua. We know that Yeshua redeemed us from the curse of the law, which the curse of the law is, what does the law say? Sin, right? Violation of, of the Torah is sin. That's how scripture defines it. And sin separates us from God. That's the curse, is being separate from God. So you violate the law, you become separate from God. That's the curse of the law. A lot of times we hear this, especially in our Western thinking, we say, oh, therefore the law must be bad because it's, it brings a curse and all this stuff, and so we need to reject it. That's not what this is saying. It's the curse of the law, which is sin equals separation from God. But Yeshua redeemed us from that curse. Why? Because now when we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Right? right? We have been cleansed by His shed blood. We have been redeemed by Him giving His life. He became a curse for us. He took the punishment. And so now, we don't have to live in fear. If we violate the Torah, if we sin, right? We repent, we receive forgiveness, and we move forward. That's what Yeshua did for us. So, Deuteronomy chapter 22, we have some more uh, sundry laws. This is interesting. It opens up, and it talks about if you see your brother's ox or your sheep or something, um, kind of, they're, they're like losing control of it, they're, it's, they're, it's lost, or you see it wandering off. It basically tells you, you're not to turn a blind eye. Oh, that's, that's Joe's cow out there. It looks like it got out of the pasture. Well, I'm sure he'll figure it out. No. Go help. Don't turn a blind eye to somebody. So we don't, we don't withhold assistance in light of somebody else's loss. Right? If we're in a position where we can do something, we, we need to be doing something. Okay? Um, if by knowledge or observance we turn a blind eye to another circumstance, it's at best selfishness. I don't really want to get involved. That's going to be inconvenience. You know? I've, I've got better things to do. It's time out of my day. At best, it's selfishness. At worst, it's sin. Because now I'm effectively saying, I don't care about that person. I don't care if they're losing something. I don't care if they're suffering loss, even though I have the ability to do something about it. So again, it's this community aspect that we talked about in the past that, you know, you're not just looking out for yourself, but you're looking out for the whole community. Right? So does that mean we have to run around and try to save the world? No. But those in our community, if we see somebody is struggling, and we know, you, you know when you can help and when you can't. And you know you can help. Don't withhold the hand of fellowship. Don't withhold that assistance. It's not, it's not righteous. Um, this is one of my favorite ones, is women wearing men's clothing. <laughs> this is a problem in our day and age, unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah, there's, um, yeah, we'll, we'll leave that there. <laughs> but this is interesting because I've heard, I don't know how many people, they, they get on their soapbox and they talk about, you know, women can't wear pants and women can't do this and this dress is prohibited, this type of attire is prohibited. Just for women, they didn't talk about what guys can and can't wear. Um, so this is a debated subject and I'm going to share with you what I believe the scripture is talking about. Um, so depending on who else you talk to, they might have a different idea. So they're wrong, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so here we go. Um, really, I believe what the scripture is talking about, it's dressing in a manner as to emulate the opposite sex, right? And not just emulate, but to look indistinguishable from the opposite sex. Okay? So a woman's going to dress so much like a man that at a distance, you're going to think that's another man. That's what the passage is talking about. Not that women can't wear pants. It's silly. You know, and the same is vice versa too. We, we have the whole trans thing. 
right? Where some of these ladies, uh, these people that are like all on in, in, in the media and everything, and these, you know, that have been doing it for a long time, they're really good at it. Mm -hmm. And you look at them, you're like, wow, that is definitely a woman, and it is not. That's what we're talking about here, right? Because the first thing I always like to bring up is, okay, so women can't wear pants. How does that work? Because now, if you look at just jeans, right? Jeans are cut for men and cut for women, right? They're styled and embellished for men and for women. So now you have an article of clothing that's for both genders, right? If a man put on girls' jeans, which sadly happens these days, um, it's, you notice, you know, right? It, you, it stands out. And then what about kilts? This is a man in a dress, right? <laughs> go, that, go tell that to a Highlander, right? That was, the, that was the article of clothing that the Irish warriors wore. Mm -hmm. The patterns designated what tribe they were from. They weren't dresses. This was their attire. Is that inappropriate? Is that a man in a dress? No. They weren't trying to look like women, and they did not look like anything, you know, they didn't look like women, even though they had the kilts on. They were very clearly men going out to war in these things. So we're talking about dressing in a way to emulate and become indistinguishable. Mm -hmm. That's what we're talking about. That's what's prohibited. So, um, what's interesting is a lot of times these prohibitions on women's dress almost always end in some type of authoritarian control over women. That's usually what it always devolves to. Um, women can't do this because we need to maintain some type of control over them. So that's, that's me on my soapbox on that issue. So take it for what it's worth. Um, we have some more laws in this, in this uh, chapter uh, concerning the safety of others. Um, talks about putting railings up on your home, right? So you have a parapet on top of your home. Everybody's hanging out. And you didn't put a railing on, and a dude falls off and dies. That's on you. You're responsible. Because you didn't think enough to, you know, something so simple to care for your neighbor, to care for others, right? Um, there's laws regarding the honoring of animals. Um, this one talks about birds. You know, you, if, you, if you see a bird and you see the chicks or the eggs and you want to take them for food, don't take the mother with the chicks or the eggs, right? Have respect, enough respect for that life, that life giver, to let it go. Take the offspring of that. Um, you know, talking about boiling a kid in its mother's milk, right? If you want to take the kid, that's fine. Animals were given for our use not for just wanton destruction. Don't, don't be wasteful, right? Have, show a measure of respect for the life giver, even, even the animals. Um, we have laws uh, regarding mixing dissimilar items, uh, seeds, animals, and fabrics. Uh, it talks about that. Um, this was interesting, and Initially, when we were kind of first coming into this and learning about, you know, the, the tassels and zit zits, so in, uh, what was it, Numbers 1537, the command is you shall make tassels, plural. And so uh, some people we were listening to, they were saying, well, it's only two is the requirement because it's plural. You only need two. That technically fulfills a commandment. And they said, well, four is traditional. And so we kind of, okay. Well, looking at this passage, Deuteronomy 22, 12, it specifies on the four corners. This is where it's not so traditional, it's a command. It's to be four. Um, and again, it's repeated. Why, why do we wear tzitzit? So we remember all the mitzvot, all the commandments of the Lord. It's a physical reminder. It's the you know, equivalent of... I don't want to say a fidget spinner, but yeah, a wedding ring. You know, just, it's in your hand all the time. You're, you're, you know, you think about it, you look at it, it's visual. What, what are these here for? What do these signify? Oh, I'm supposed to remember not to steal, not to cheat, to be honoring, all these types of things. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, thank you. It's the equivalent of a wedding ring, yeah. essentially. 
It's a sign. It's a sign, yeah, outward sign. Mm -hmm. And it's it's not it's not so much for others, it's more for us. But it is an outward sign for others, too. Mm -hmm. You know, people, what are those funny strings you got hanging there? Let me explain that to you. I'd be happy to tell you all about that. Funny you ask. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of how it works. Well, um, we are to be a set apart people. Yeah, we're set apart. Not everybody wears them. So you will stand out. Not everybody wears wedding rings, except for the married people, mm -hmm. hopefully. All right, um, so moving on, we are going to talk about laws regarding sexual assault. Now, this is a little bit of a heavy topic. Um, try not to be very graphic here. Um, but women historically had virtually no rights in the surrounding nations. Okay? In a lot of cultures, a woman was property. And not only was she property, in some cultures, she was even valued less than livestock. Because it was seen like a livestock can produce something a woman just consumes. So they were like lower than the livestock. So it's got to make everybody feel really great. Um, the, but that's, that's, that was a lot of, in the, the early centuries, that was a lot of women's reality. Um, historically, it proved out that Christian or, you know, uh, husbands of faith, husbands who follow the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the women that they married, their wives, would actually have a longer life expectancy because they were treated so much better. They had laws in place. They were treated as equals, as co-heirs of the promise, right? And so they just had a, a higher life expectancy because of it. And so that was very attractive for women. You mean I can get some rights? I'm not treated like, you know, a little bit better than dirt? You know, I'm treated like a human being? I'm cared for and honored? Yeah, I'll, I'll worship that God. That's an easy sell. So... But anyway, there's, there's cases here for even, even a wife of the nations, right? So, say the husband, I don't know, something's wrong with him, and he, he says, you know what, I'm, I, I, I don't like this girl anymore, and I'm not sure that she was a virgin when we were married. All right? so he's bringing this accusation. Well, that's a serious thing, because now you're effectively saying she was committing prostitution before you married her. Right? Because again, fornication was illegal. So the only way to do that before, uh, you know, before marriage is prostitution. So you're saying that a daughter of the nations, a daughter of Israel, was a prostitute, and you didn't know it. So that was effectively the accusation. So again, you'd bring her to the bed uh, to then, to the judges, and the parents would step up. This is where the parents say, okay, you're accusing my daughter. Right? I know I know she's your wife, but that's still our daughter that you're accusing. Now you're not just accusing her, you're accusing our family. Mm -hmm. Right? You're coming against our family line, our tribe. Right? Mm -hmm. That's in question. So they would bring out the proof of the daughter's virginity. Now I don't know if you remember way back, I think we were in the house we talked about this, but when the bride would get married they would have a sheet or a cloth or something they would lay on the bed. Mm -hmm. And then when the marriage was consummated, usually the hymen was broken at that point, and there would be a little bit of bleeding, and then that would get on the cloth, and the parents would save that. Um, a lot of times they would hang it up and display it after the consummation. You can imagine this has got to be a you know, big deal for everybody. But, um, I don't know if that would fly today, but that's, that was the thing. And so it was like a celebratory thing, like, look, this was, you know, she was a virgin when she got, this is a, a proud moment. But that would be saved, the parents would hold on to that. And so later, if the husband decides to come back and bring this false accusation, like, no, no, here's the cloth right here, here's proof. Now, what happens, um, if she's exonerated, now the husband's in trouble, because he brought a false accusation, okay? So he's subject to a fine for sure. He's going to get fined. He's going to lose some money. Possibly he might get flogged. Um, this this portion, uh, this passage does talk about the thirty nine lashes. When somebody commits a violation and is subject to punishment but not death, 
they could potentially get up to or get 39 lashes, not 40, because that, that's where they say that's too much. But they would get 39. So he could get literally 39 lashes and fined for bringing this accusation because he's accusing his wife, he's accusing a daughter of Israel, and he's accusing the family. Okay? Now, um, and then furthermore, after this, his, his ability to divorce that, that woman is off, it's off the table. She's with him forever. You know, I'm sure their relationship was probably going to need some counseling at that point. <laughs> but um, but why, was, why would they say the divorce was off the table? Because even though women did have some rights, it's not like today where a woman was reliant on that husband to provide for her. Okay? This is why being a barren woman in that culture was so huge. Because after your husband died, then your sons became your provision. And if you didn't have sons, and your husband died, and you were a widow without children, that was a bad spot to be in. Mm -hmm. You know, Ruth and Naomi. Good example. So, um, you know, effectively having children was, uh, you know, for women for sure, was that was your social security, is have some kids. But anyway, this husband, he couldn't divorce her. He was... That he had to provide her because he brought a false accusation. She was exonerated. Uh, you're, you're not going to defame her twice. All right? So, um, now if she was found to be guilty, then she would be stoned. Because again, we go back to the laws of fornication, all these things, right? That was, pro that was prohibited. So, yeah. There were laws regarding adultery. If you caught an adulterer, both parties were to be put to death. It was a non-negotiable. I'm getting the sign to go faster. Sorry. <laughs> I know we've got festivities. I'm trying to get through it. But that's interesting because Yeshua, when they brought the woman caught in adultery, right? Yeah. They said, we caught this woman in adultery. And you know, you know what the law says. You've got to stone her. Well, where was the dude? Exactly. Nobody brought him. The law says both parties. He so you should know it was a setup right away. <laughs> I'll be there in a minute. Hang on. Just a <laughs> yeah. Take your first. <laughs> so, um, now we do have some laws concerning uh, the issue of rape. Now, in a lot of our Bibles, where it's going to be translated rape. That's really not a very good translation. Um, it really should be rendered sexual relations. Because there's so much in, in that passage that he talks about several situations. Not all of them are what we would say, quote unquote, rape. Right? There, some are, but not all of it. So it's, it's a little too broad a term. Um, and that can be kind of misleading. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, it talks about, so if a woman is assaulted in the city and she cries out, then the offender is guilty, she is not, okay? Because there was resistance, she was resisting. Mm -hmm. So she was violated, she's the victim, okay? Um, so in that case, the offender is executed. Now, if she fails to cry out, then it's a, consent is assumed, right? If there's not resistance, then consent is assumed, and then it's fornication, slash adultery, what have you, and both parties are uh, punished. Now it talks about, that's in the city, and then it talks about, gives us another scenario, in the countryside, okay? What happens if she's out there alone? And no one is present to see or hear her resistance, right? It's just her and some guy out in the field, and she can scream as loud as she wants, nobody's around. Well. She's not guilty because the idea is she could have resisted. Nobody was there to help her. She's still the victim. The offender is executed. But this is where it gets a little interesting because we still have this whole connotation of rape in our mind, right? But we need to back up and look at this. One, it would be totally inappropriate for a woman to be in the field by herself, right? So she's not supposed to be there anyway. And so then that raises the question, what was she doing there? Well, 
a lot of times she could be out there trying to meet someone. You know? You think of it more as a case of date rape might be a better, a better example. She went out to meet this boy, or what have you, meet a man that was either an illicit meeting or the parents didn't approve of him or something like that. She had no intention of doing any of these things, but one thing led to another and he took advantage of her. She's still innocent, okay? But it's not necessarily cut and dry, you know, just a, a random stranger accosting. Um, and again, we go back to the story of Ruth, right? What did Boaz tell his men? Don't molest the, the women gleaning, but he said women, plural, because it was dangerous to be out there by yourself as a woman, right? So they would not be out there by themselves. Um, let's keep going. Um, there would be, so what happens if a, an unengaged girl, right? So single girl, um, she is caught in the act which implies consent. Um, the offender would be required to marry her. Now, a lot of our Bibles render this rape, right? So why are, why are they being forced to marry a rapist? So this is a pretty interesting, but it talks about how she's caught in the act, and the implication is that it's consent because she's not crying out this and that, right? Boyfriend and girlfriend take things a little too far. Guess what? Now you're husband and wife. You're going to get married. Why is that? Because it says uh, she was humiliated, right? Because she had, um, she was with a man before marriage. So now if she's not found guilty under other areas of the law, you can't just abandon her, right? If the man just goes off and leaves, I got what I want and I'm done, see ya, right? Then now she has nobody to provide for her. And the fact that she's not a virgin anymore Makes her takes her completely off the eligible uh, bachelor bachelorette list, right? She's not able to be married. Nobody's going to touch her, right? Because now she's got a reputation. Yeah. You know what happened with Joseph and Mary? You know, whoa, she's pregnant before the wedding. Uh, we're going to get a divorce. We're not even married yet, but he was like, I'm not, I'm not doing that. Mm -hmm. This is what that's talking about right here. So. No, if you, things go too far, shotgun wedding. Because now she needs to be provided for. And, you know, if, uh, if you're, how does it go? If you're good enough to, if, if she's good enough to poke, she's good enough to yoke. <laughs> so, nice. yeah, so anyway. Um, that sounds very country. <laughs> <laughs> So, but here's the thing, we're, we're talking about her support, right? You don't, again, honoring others. You don't just take advantage of people, right? That's not how things were done. <laughs> put, that in, put that on Twitter, right? So, so even in the most extreme case of personal, physical violation, the rights of the victim were either initiated or maintained, securing justice. That's what we're talking about, securing justice for those who have suffered. So that's what all these, these kind of laws were about, is justice for the victim. And, you know, at that time, there were, I don't think there were any cultures that had anything set up like that. You know, you were... There were the haves and the have-nots, and if you couldn't take from others, you people were taking from you, and that was it. There was no in between. There was no care for your fellow man, kind of thing. So, chapter twenty-three, we get into some more more laws. Um, it talks about those excluded from the assembly. Um, Ammonites and Moabites were excluded until the tenth generation. This is interesting. Now. Ammon and Moab were descendants of Lot from his daughters, right? Remember that whole uh, uh, inappropriate relationship? That was the offspring there. Now, again, why does that automatically eliminate them? Not that part does not eliminate them. What eliminates them is that when the people came out of Egypt in the Exodus, 
they came across Ammon, Ammonites and Moabites, which were effectively distant relatives, right? That tribe of people. And they did not extend a hand of fellowship. They did not show any hospitality to their brethren, effectively. And Moabites, Moab, hired Bilaam to curse the Israelites, right? Remember the king. So he hired the seer to curse the people. So on those two accounts, the Lord says, you don't let these people into the assembly. Right? Not, in, not at least until the 10th generation. Now this is where it gets in interesting, because now we have the problem of Ruth. Right? Ruth was a Moabitess. She was from that, that people group. So there's two views um, that I came across is that one, Ruth was beyond the 10th generation. That's one view. The other view, and this is a little more prominent, is that that law only applied to the men. Because again, the men are the ones that carry the seed. You're, you're, they're, they're the seed givers. The women are the seed carriers. So it's also interesting that Ruth left behind her identity. She did not come into the assembly as a Moabite, right? She says, your God will be my God, your people will be my people. I'm effectively leaving my identity behind, and I'm embracing a new identity. And that's very, very much just what the Lord calls us to do. Let's leave our sinful nature behind and embrace his nature and his character and his ways. Okay? We don't enter the kingdom maintaining our identity of our fleshly fallen nature. We need a new identity. And so I believe that's how Ruth was able to enter because of her statement. Your God will be my God. I'm not going to worship those gods anymore like the Moabites did. I'm leaving that behind. Your people will be my people. The culture of your people I'm embracing for myself. I'm leaving my old culture behind. What happened to the other two uh, daughters-in-law? They went back. Ruth did not. She said, I'm going to go with this impoverished widow, because remember, all her sons died? Effectively, her social security was wiped out. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to hang out with you, because I want what you have. So, interesting. We're, we're a call to abandon our, our sinful identities and become a new creation in Yeshua. It um, talks about how escaped slaves are to be given sanctuary, um, laws regarding debts and loan interest, uh, 39 lashes for Torah violations, we mentioned that, um, and Leverite marriage, if you've ever come across that term. So basically, um, like I have a brother, right? I die, then it would be my brother's responsibility to go to my wife and have another child, and then that child would carry my last name, not his. Right? Say if he was from, you know, whatever. That was Leverite marriage. Now the reason for that is so that that way that name, that inheritance would not be lost. Was that only if she didn't have a son? Correct. That yes. Okay. Yep. Yeah, okay. Got. And she also, no kids. <laughs> and, and again, Social Security, right? The husband's dead. He can't provide anymore. So now she has to raise this son, and as soon as this son can start, you know, becomes of age and can start, you know, supporting, then it's his job to support his mother until she passes. So that's it's ensuring. It's like saying, hey, you're a close relative. You have to ensure that's it, the Social Security. You have to ensure that she's cared for. Okay. So we could say Taylor has the best inheritance right now in the room. She's rocking it. She's going to retire well. <laughs> so um, so that, that's pretty interesting. It's, it's a whole interesting concept on how that works. And it talks about, you know, the man did have the right of refusal. He could refuse it. But then he would embrace a curse, right? right. That he would have to go to the judges at the city gate and say, I'm not going to do this. And so then the woman would take his sandal off, spit on him, and then he would get a verbal 
curse, and they said, let him be known as the family who had the, as the man who had, uh, the family of the man who had his sandal pulled off. So it was kind of like derivative, you know, all the time. Now he's like, no, that's the guy that would provide for that woman's support, that wouldn't provide for her social security. He's selfish. That's effectively what they were saying. So interesting, interesting topic. There's a movie. It was not like a big box office hit. It was kind of a lower budget movie. It's called Loving Leah. I'm trying to think of who made it. It had to be 90s-ish. But the whole idea is the guy had two brothers from a Jewish family, and the one, one guy was a rabbi, he was married, and he died unexpectedly. Well, the other brother has completely rejected his faith. He's living off in New York City. He's about to get married. Oh, yeah, that's a good one, man. It was a, yeah. it was a good one. Okay, but anyway, so he gets this call like, hey, um, we got this Leverite marriage thing. And they're like, you need to come back home. And so he's not even sure what this is. And he's meeting with this girl and the rabbi. And he's like, no, I can't. I'm, I'm engaged. So I'm going to be married. He's a doctor. Da, da, I'm a doctor. Um, and all this. And so, so she's like, well, give me your shoe. And she's explaining what's got to happen, and he can't go through with it. He didn't. He, so he's like, "Well, I tell you what. How about we just get married, and then we'll get divorced in three months?" And you know, he had it all <laughs> planned out. Anyway, it, it was a love story. It was very cute. But um, yeah, love, well, loving Leah was, was good. good. Loving Leah was a really cool movie. Don't we? Have it? No, we don't. What's it? What was it called? Loving, loving Leah. It was a Hallmark. Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, it was. No, it was a Hallmark movie. It's Hallmark. So you have to Google Hallmark movies. And yeah. Kind of, it might be on uh, YouTube. Yeah. But it, yes. was, it was a cool movie. But the was, whole yeah. theme was around that Leverite yep. marriage theme. So pretty interesting. Um, all right. We're almost there. Um, chapter 25 talks about Amalek. Now, Amalek also like the Moabites and Ammonites, where they withheld the hand of fellowship, Amalek attacked the people. Um, he's considered the perpetual enemy of God. So at the Battle of Rephidim, he actually attacked the, tailing, the trailing end of the convoy that was coming out of Egypt. So this is going to be the women, the children, and the elderly. That's who he attacked first. So he's considered the perpetual enemy of God. It's interesting here because if you look at his name, his name begins with Ayan, which is the symbol for the I. Okay? The gamatri, or the numerical value of his name, is 240. Now, this is where we get into some of the mysticism. What does that mean? It's equivalent to the Hebrew word for doubt. So from a Hebraic perspective, when we look at this, we see the ayin and we see the gematria of 240, and we say his name suggests the eye of doubt. That's Amalek, the eye of doubt. Okay? What does that mean? Unbelief is spiritual blindness, right? Which is a perpetual attribute of the enemy of God. If you look at every enemy of God in Scripture, it's always doubt, right? Doubt is plays a factor. Unbelief, yes. Um, the twelve spies, right? What was their sin? The sin of unbelief. That doubt. So, pretty interesting. So, um, there, there's prohibitions on you know against Amalek. You know, basically, don't forget what this guy did to you. Now, the half Torah and the Brit Hadashah. Um, we're from Isaiah, and that's uh, the fifth half Torah of consolation. Um, again, offering encouragement uh, in the phase of exile, so check that out. Um, that's, um, we're not going to read it here today for the sake of time. And into the New Testament, we're Matthew 5, 27 through 30, and it's a prohibition against lust is what Yeshua is talking about. And he says, you know, if your eye is, you know, is causing you to lust, pluck it out. Or if your hand is causing you to sin, cut it off. Okay? Now, we didn't really touch on it, but in this part, it talks about those who are disfigured can't come into the assembly. And yet, we get all the way into Matthew, and Yeshua is telling us to disfigure ourselves if it'll stop us from sinning. 
Now this is interesting, it's, it's a little metaphorical, but this is interesting because normally any kind of disfigurement would exclude you from the assembly. But, going back to Deuteronomy 23, if we rid ourselves, you know, talking about the captive, the beautiful captive, how they had to cut her hair and her nails and change her clothes, get rid of the outward things that identify us with sin, right? Cutting, you know, getting rid of the eye, cutting off the hand, rejecting the old nature, then we can come into fellowship just like Ruth. So normally disfigurement would keep us out of the assembly, but Yeshua says no. If that eye is causing you to lust, the hand causing you to sin, if these body parts are identifying you with your sinful nature, get rid of them. And again, metaphorically, don't pluck your eyes out, please. <laughs> but get rid of them. Leave that identity and embrace a new identity. And then just like Ruth, we can come into the assembly. We can come into that fellowship, rejecting that old nature. Um, 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 5, we kind of talk about it, but again, that was a prohibition against sexual immorality. And it's interesting that anytime you have any sort of sexual immorality, a soul tie is formed. Okay? There is a spiritual unity there when two people come together in that manner. So pervasive immorality in today's culture is a means to defile and spiritually blind people to God's truth. What's one of the major things that we see out of all the different sins and everything that we see, what is on the rise? Pornography for men and women. Um, there's more and more avenues for people to put themselves out there in that manner in, in media. We see transvestites, homosexuality, you know, all this kinds of stuff. Um, now you can be with whoever you want, how many other people you want. There's this whole hookup culture, right, with dating apps and all this stuff. And it's just growing and growing. And now they're trying to, you know, let's indoctrinate our children. You know, let's, when they're four or five years old, let's start giving them material so they can start talking about these concepts. Right. You know, and then now we want to even attack their gender. Right? It's a direct affront because the gravity of sexual immorality goes right to your spirit. Right to your spirit, man. So, it's, it really is a way to defile and spiritually blind people to God's truth. Um, Balaam, he sought to tempt the people away from God through sexual immorality. Right? If I can get you to form a soul tie with these people, then they will pull you away. Same thing happened to Solomon. He had all those wives. What happened to him? He drifted away from God. All those soul ties pull him in different directions. So, it's interesting that Balaam, we talked about that, that he had ayin hara, right? The evil eye. And Amalek possessed the eye of doubt. Both lust and doubt are the enemy's tools to destroy God's people. He's at work hard in this culture with lust. And then what's, what's right behind it is doubt. Oh, God's ways, that's antiquated. So what are you, a Puritan? Really? You guys believe all that stuff? That's yesterday. Nobody does that anymore. Right? That's restrictive. Why would you let somebody control you like that? You can have all this freedom. So... Lust and doubt are the enemy's tools to destroy God's people. But again, what do these, all these laws have in common? It's God's concern for our welfare. They're foundational to a just and righteous society. And then by observing these laws, you know, we hear the commandment, you know, love, love God with all your heart, mind, body, and, you know, and your neighbor as yourself. What does that look like? Because I have a different opinion on what loving my neighbor looks like than you or you. But here it's outlined. This is what loving your neighbor looks like. So now I can be just and walk righteously among my community because I've got a baseline. I've got some principles I can look at and say, hey, okay, now I know 
how to love my neighbor in a righteous manner. And there's a standard. It's not just whatever I think of, which is the pinnacle of lawlessness. Romans 13, 9. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. God's laws, God's Torah, tells us exactly how to do that. If we're diligent to study and learn and apply, then we will walk and live righteously. And we can be at peace with our fellow man. So that is the Torah portion for this week. Um, hopefully it was a blessing. Again, I do encourage you guys to go back through because we just kind of cherry picked and gave you a, 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 you know, a 10,000 foot view of it. There's a whole lot more in there. Um, but yeah, I'm sure we'll, we'll come back and have a lot of great, great conversations. Surrounding that.